you got about 160 as, uh, in the list. So, so far. Numbers are climbing pretty good. Hi, folks. Uh, just to let you know, I pasted this into the chat box as well, but I'm Pat Watson. I'm the room host for this meeting today. <clears throat> just a few housekeeping things. Uh, you don't have audio video capabilities to Ryan. This is the, uh, basically a webinar, so he can see, you can see and hear him, but uh, there's no option to turn on video or audio for you guys. Um, if you have any questions for Ryan at any point, just uh, type them in the chat box, and I will save them and give them to him later in the presentation. If you have any tech issues, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, email is in the chat box, uh, CP Institute support. And if you have any non-technical uh, issues, you can email the other address that I put in there as well. At the end of the meeting, I'll announce the keyword for the meeting, and uh, which is required for you to receive credit and also remind you to take the survey. So meeting, <clears throat> uh, the presenter for the meeting, of course, is Ron Edmond with Henry County Schools. Title of his presentation, Integrating Practical Mathematics into Agricultural Courses. Um, Ryan, we got 77 so far. So if you want to give it another minute or so, that's fine. Um, All right, yeah, I'll wait just a little bit longer. 131, so it's up to you. Okay. All right, guys, we'll wait just about another minute. Um, see if we have any more stragglers come in, but I'll... Uh, We'll go ahead and start here in just a second. Okay, guys, we'll go ahead and start right there. Um, so as he, uh, as he said, my name is Ryan Emmett. For those of y'all may not know me, I teach at uh, Henry County Schools and uh, primarily teach at EW Grove, which is the freshman school uh, where I teach agri-science. And um, been there for, uh, it's going to my fifth year, but it's going to my 12th year, I think, of teaching. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about a little bit today is, uh, is integrating uh, practical mathematics and agriculture. And uh, so this kind of came about uh, as I was completing my master's um, at Murray State. And uh, when I was trying to figure out a capstone project um, or a, a thesis, I decided real quick I didn't want to do a thesis. So I, I decided on a capstone project. And, and I tried to do something that was going to help me, um, you know, not only help me, but something that I might be able to share with other teachers across the state. So Essentially what I did is I tried to examine how, I tried to create examples and, and things like that about how we can integrate uh, math and science into our ag courses. And you know, when you first hear that, you say, well, that's, that's kind of ludicrous. We already have plenty of math and science in our courses. And that's true, but the thing is, is that we look at a lot of the math and the science that we have, and it doesn't really align with a lot of the standards uh, you know, that we see in biology and, and algebra. And I know that our standards do, but a lot of times we don't have a lot of the, I guess you can call it the, uh, the content in there um, to really kind of help some of those other classes. So I um, want to spend a little bit of time looking at that today. Uh, and I apologize, first off, if there's an echo in here, I was going to go to the school, they're waxing the floors there. So I'm in the, uh, the spare room at my house. But, and if you hear some odd noises. That's my dog. He's just kind of running around. So, um, so what are we doing today? So I've already kind of explained a little bit about the idea of what we're doing. Um, the biggest thing that I want you to understand, obviously this is not a one size fits all. 
Okay, uh, what I do and what I've kind of created and what I found is, is what's going to work for me. Um, you know, you may look at it and you may absolutely hate it. And that's, if that's the case, that's okay. Um, again, this is just what has worked for me. Uh, we're not going to spend our entire time looking at research, uh, telling us that we need to integrate math and we need to integrate science and all this other stuff. Um, that's great, but I want to, you know, I want to give you something that you can walk away with and say, okay, this is something that I can actually utilize in my classes. And, you know, here's some ideas of, of things that I can do. Um, you know, this is not going to be something where, you know, I'm going to sit there and tell you, okay, this is exactly how you fully implement, implement more math into your courses. Um, a big content of this is just going to be us looking at some of the examples that, uh, that I've created some of those resources that I found. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that's, that's what's going to help us most. Um, because we're all very capable of going through there and, and figuring out math and things like that and how to implement those. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of tough just to sit down and say, okay, you know, what, what math concept would align with this standard? Um, so, you know, that, that gets a little bit tough sometimes. So I want to, I want to kind of let you walk away with that. And we'll take a look at that here in just a minute. So, um, you know, I, I see this. And when I started down and, and looking at my, my capstone project, um, you know, I, I really asked myself, do I already have enough math in my class? Um, you know, yeah, we did some math. Uh, but when I sat down and I really asked myself three questions, um, you know, that's when I really kind of started questioning, you know, what are we, what am I doing? How am I really helping the school? Uh, so, you know, those three questions that I think you need to ask yourself, is it rigorous, is it practical, and is it helpful to high school math courses? Um, and I think if the answer is no, then you might want to take a closer look at what we're doing in our classes. Um, some of y'all are absolutely great, um, you know, as far as implementing some of those things. You know, I wasn't. Um, you know, I was more interested in going outside and and, and doing those certain hands-on projects and I didn't really think about the math. And, and when I did include math, um, you know, I didn't always, it wasn't that rigorous. Uh, and I think that's the problem that we run into a lot of times is that the math that we do include, um, it's not that terribly rigorous. Uh, just because we do some simple arithmetic in class doesn't mean that we're doing our part to, to help the school. Um, and we'll talk about that here more in just a second. But uh, so this is a big thing to me, you know, you know, what if you're terrible at math? That's okay. I am too. Uh, you're having a guy presenting a math course uh, that actually failed a high school math class. Uh, so, yeah, that's something I tell my kids every year. Um, you know, that wasn't my proudest moment, but, you know, it is what it is. So, uh, but the thing is, remember, we're not experts in everything. You know, we didn't, you know, the vast majority of what we teach um, there's no way that we, we can be experts in it. What they're, what they're asking us to do every year uh, and, you know, changing things up and implementing more things and things like that, you know, it gets a little bit tough. So there's, there's absolutely no way we can be 100% expert. Um, what has really worked for me is to create an example sheet. So a lot of the math that I had done, um, you know, creating these examples, I wasn't, you know, I had to really look up and, and understand how to do. Um, so I basically created my own little dummy sheet for me uh, that I can now give to my students and then create another real world example after that. Uh, the big thing is though, is when you do this, you've got to work with your math teachers to align these standards. Um, and we'll talk some more about that here in a little bit. So what can I do to help make it rigorous? Uh, so I think that's the big thing, you know, when you have administrators walk in your room, you know, one of the things that they're looking for is, you know, how are you implementing some of these other content standards into your own course? Um, you know, it's great that we can sit there and we can talk about the reproductive cycle and, you know, and things like that of, of livestock. Um, you know, we can do that all day, but I think when we really examine, you know, we're all in this together as far as, you know, looking at our test scores and looking at how the school is doing and things like that. Uh, the thing that I wanted to do is I sat down and I examined, examined the standards from algebra one, algebra two and geometry. Um, and I've got algebra one and geometry down here. We'll look at those here in a little bit. We're not gonna spend much time because I'll start saying that number drop or as far as people logging out if we do. Uh, the thing is, if you know, if it's gonna challenge you, it's gonna challenge a student. Not every student in your class is gonna to want to challenge. Uh, but I think if you go through there and you make it part of your expectation, 
then that's going to be something they can come through there and really appreciate that, hey, they're really trying to help me out. Um, you know, and our students, we've got to remember that not every one of them are going to be on the same level. You know, we've got classes that, you know, you've got a 30 plus ACT kid in there with a kid that's, you know, sitting at a 16, 17. Um, you know, that's, that's part of education. But so you've got to kind of vary that up and try to make it rigorous for both of those students. So um, here's the big thing that we look at in our ag courses and how can we make it practical? Uh, you know, that's the good thing about agriculture and really any CT class. Um, is that if we can really look at these math standards and we can really make it practical, that's the advantage that we have over just a standard math class. Because, you know, we've all been there. We've sat there and we've opened up our algebra books back in high school and we've looked at, um, you know, problem set 3-2 or whatever else. And it's just straight math questions. Um, that's great, we learn how to do that. But, you know, what's the one question we always ask ourselves whenever we're in there? When am I gonna use this in real life? So we could use our ag courses to say this is how you're going to utilize that in real life okay um so you know i went back to this you know if there's no relevance to your course uh then what value does it add to your class so you know that goes back to my thing of of don't force it um you know just for the sake of saying that you did math uh you know and that's the thing i you know and i've been guilty of this before too you have a uh, an observation one day and you force certain things in there um, you know, that's, those kids look at you like you're crazy. And, you know, if, if you make it part of your class every day, that's something they're going to appreciate. Um, examine your own standards and look at the current standards, uh, you know, dealing with your math courses, um, and ask yourself, you know, what agricultural concept can I teach, which would relate to these standards. So just a quick example. <clears throat> I uh, looked here, this was uh, geometry, I believe. So no one used coordinates to compute parameters of polygons and areas of triangles and rectangles. Um, so this was a question that I had developed here and this is something pretty simple, but you know, it kind of gives you an idea. So, you know, we're looking at example when you're fencing a field, is it really a nice perfect square or rectangle? Um, you know, the answer is no to that. So uh, oftentimes a lot of our fields are gonna have multiple shapes. Uh, you gotta go around trees, around property lines. Um, when you're trying to estimate how much wire you need to fence it in, it can be achieved by looking at the perimeter of the field. So what's going to happen with those kids and say, okay, so I see perimeter here and now I'm making that real world connection and saying, okay, so that's actually why that's going to be an issue. That's why, that's how I'm actually going to utilize it um, in a real world situation. So real simple one here, we just kind of set out a field. Um, you know, we need to know the perimeter of the field and how many rolls of wire we would need uh, in the total acreage. So you know, we've got this and what I try to do in all the examples that I had created is I didn't just leave it at one math problem. You know, I wanted to integrate certain other concepts that maybe are a little bit more elementary, but it still requires that student to think. So, you know, we got here, first off, we want another perimeter of the field. Okay. How many rolls of wire we're going to need? Um, you know, when you go to the store, you buy 80 rod wire, one rod equals 16 and a half feet. So they're going to have to go through there and do some couple of different math, um, arithmetic and things like that in order to figure out the answer. They can't just say, okay, this is what your perimeter is, la da 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 um, So that's one thing that I really try to do with all of them. And uh, you know, that worked for me. So, and this one here, this was the, the question that I had presented to them, but also um, had created an example. So like I said, we'll look at that here in just a minute. Uh, so here's the biggest thing that I think that we struggle with. And uh, I know I do is that, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, is it helpful to our high school math courses? Um, now, that's the hardest one for me. Uh, the thing is, is that I don't think it has to always directly align to a standard to be completely helpful. Um, you know, I think there are certain concepts that we can do in our classes that comes through there. And uh, even though we aren't teaching linear functions, you know, we're teaching concepts of it, which kind of connects the dots for that student. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think anything that we can do to help, um, the other courses, that's great. Um, you know, one thing that drives me crazy is that, you know, and I, I guess I used to be like this too, but we sit back and, you know, we sit in our own little bubble. Um, I don't think we can do that anymore, especially in today's time. Uh, you know, we've got to collaborate with our math departments. And that's a struggle sometimes because, you know, 
sometimes they don't respect us as teachers. They don't respect CT. Um, you know, that's, that's not always the case. And I think that, uh, that I'm fortunate that we have some really good math teachers at my school uh, that would sit down with me. So um, you've got to make that connection. And as much as you may not want to, uh, if you aren't working with them, then you're not necessarily, I guess, helping out their classes as well. Because um, I think one of the coolest things you can do is if you can say, you know, look what we're doing in here, and how it aligns in your class, that's really gonna kind of surprise them quite a bit. Um, because like I said, a lot of times they, they probably don't really respect what we're doing. Uh, so I wanna come back to this here in just a second because I've already got the tab pulled up. Um, and then we'll look at some of these examples too. So actually let's go ahead and we'll, we'll look at those right now. Uh, so the examples, that's uh, standards, we don't really, well, uh, if you've never looked at the standards, just have fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they're very, there's a lot of them. Uh, there's a lot of information here, uh, but it has a lot of good information because it gives you some examples and things like that. Again, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on here, but you know, what I wanted to try to do is sit down and look at standards. And what I focused on primarily was algebra one and geometry because that's what's offered at, at EW Grove. Uh, kids will take Algebra 2 typically when they get to the high school or geometry, either one. But, uh, you know, I wanted to sit down there and, and look at it and, and try to figure out ways that it's going to align. And so one thing that I want to make perfectly clear is that, you know, I just completed this project in May. Uh, yeah, May. So, you know, this is still a work in progress. Um, you know, have I sat down and aligned everything that we need to do? Absolutely not. Um, you know, and I'm hoping that, you know, eventually I can get there, but you know, obviously standards change and things change and stuff like that. So, you know, we got to get to that point eventually. But um, let me pull this down real quick. So you've got your algebra one uh, standards there. You know, woo, there you go. And then you got algebra two, or excuse me, geometry. So those are the two courses that, that work for me. You may, you may want to look at some different things that kind of look at that. So, all right. So looking at some examples. So these are the ones that, uh, that I had created and, um, and I can't sit there and say that, um, you know, I just completely come up with these off the top of my head. Some of them, uh, you know, I was able to, cause it was simple. Others, not so much. So, you know, you look at one thing, arithmetic, uh, sequence. Um, now, this is very elementary as far as how I wrote some of these uh, examples. But like I said, whenever I do this, I have the first page is an example. So it shows the students, here's how you work it out. Okay, so very simple. Um, I explain what it is and what it does. Uh, so for instance, if you have two cows, uh, and they each have one calf a year, where would you have, how many calves would you have in 10 years? You know, obviously that's very simple math. Uh, you don't have to plug it into the formula to figure this out. But um, what I wanted to do is show them that, okay, this is how you do it, but then here's a situation of where you can apply it. So in this situation, um, you know, a farmer's looking over the records of his farm. He notices he has uh, an average increase of 2.3 bushels per year over the last 10 years. Um, he read something, basically said, uh, average yield increases roughly two to five bushels per year with new technologies. He becomes interested and he wants to see what his average yield will be in 22 years. Um, you know, is that going to be completely real life in every situation? Not necessarily, but it kind of gets them an idea and kind of gets them thinking. So, you know, his current average 165 bushels an acre, what was potential yield be in 20 years under the current increases? Um, and then I've got another what if question. What if the average increases to five bushels an acre over the first 10 years? what would his yield be then at the 22 years in this scenario? So kids can look at this and they can say, okay, you know, this is different, but here's my formula. Here's how I work it out. And they just simply plug and play uh, as far as put the information in there. So um, that's what I wanted to do. And so what I have here, and this is in the files folder and uh, you all can obviously download this, take it, run with it, do whatever you need to do. I think it's 43 pages. Um, so that's going to be about 20 different scenarios. And again, this is going to be something that I continue to add to, but, um, and I want to tell you, you know, is I told you earlier, I'm not great at math. So is there going to be things that are wrong in here? 
probably. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, if you are great at math, you can go through and fix it. Uh, and if you fix it, let us know. But um, I tried to really look at and research how it, and make sure this was doing right. So um, you've got some stuff here. So here's a break even point. Uh, you got the equation there, what each of the, the variables mean. And uh, again, here's another example. Uh, and then there again, you've got the problem statement um, on the next page. So again, example, and then a scenario, because if, I don't think if you, you know how our kids are, if you don't give them that example, they're simply going to go through there and they're going to raise their hands 20 times. And then all of a sudden you're going to lose all your class time from answering the questions. Uh, so if you get in that scenario, you're still going to have questions, but you're also going to have say, you know, you're going to have something in front of them that you can refer back to. And uh, hopefully that'll help them out a little bit. Um, so there's really no rhyme or reason to, to how this is formed together. Um, you know, I basically, as I sat down, I would just, I'd work on it a couple hours a night, then I go on to something else. So you may have some ag business stuff and it may go to some environmental, then you may have some animal science. So if that drives you nuts, I apologize. You can put it online and, and rearrange it and do whatever you need to do. So uh, carrying capacity and population growth. So this is, uh, this is allowing them to do some, uh, some pretty, pretty cool math um, and then put it into a, a graph situation here. Um, but anyway, so we're not going to go through all 43 pages because uh, I've only got about 20 minutes left or so, uh, 25, something like that. But you want to make sure that that you show them these. Uh, you want to give them those examples and, and, and connect that to real life. Um, and again, if you don't like this, that's fine. Take it and, and make it your own. Do whatever you need to do. Uh, you're not going to hurt my feelings at all. I'll just put it in a PDF because it's easier to download. Um, but like I said, I tried to go through here and, and give a lot of different examples. Um, so you got some compounding interest, you've got some, uh, some dairy stuff, um, land level, and I think I just threw that in there at last minute because I was needing some more ideas. So estimating yield, but you, you kind of get the idea there. Um, I didn't put a whole lot of mechanics stuff in here. So if you teach mechanics, obviously there's a lot of different things out there that you can utilize. Um, this is gonna focus more on the, the plant, animal science, and ag business side of things, just because that's what I do most in, you know, in my agri-science classes. Um, but hopefully there's, there's something in here that you can utilize and, uh, and kind of go through there and, and make it your own. Uh, so you'll see here, this is what I pulled a lot of my information from. Uh, so some of y'all probably have this in your classroom already. If you don't, I'm gonna highly recommend that you get it. Um, so mathematical applications in agriculture, that's a Cengage book. Uh, and I'm too cheap to buy the, the hardcover book, so I rent it. Um, I think it was like $10, $15 to rent the book, and I think I got it for six months. So I wanna take just a little bit of time to show you that and, uh, and kind of show you a lot of the cool things that it has. Um, so when you look at this, uh, this is not necessarily going to, you know, completely align with everything uh, in an algebra class, but it does have some algebra, has a lot of geometry. Um, it's a really, really good book. Uh, and there may be a new edition out, um, but I pulled from this a lot. Um, and so you can go down through here and get kind of an idea of all the different things. So you have just simple, uh, math operations, measurements, special topics, uh, crop production. Um, and what I like about it is that it breaks it down. So this is where you want to make it relevant to your area. You know, when I lived in Decatur County, we didn't have hardly, I don't guess we had any tobacco, but you get up here to Henry County and you've got a pretty good bit of it. Uh, so, you know, if I want to talk about tobacco, uh, then I can go through here and, and it's going to give me some math that I can apply to that. And so, um, you know, you definitely want to make it make it relevant so you kind of get the idea there but we'll uh, we'll look at kind of how this does and so when I made mine I, I modeled it after this book um, and so you give an example and then you give some exercises um, 
Now, the wording is a little weird in here, and, and sometimes they, there's a little bit of a stretch on, you know, the, the math that they're doing. But I think that it's all a really, really good concept that you can look at and, uh, and really, really utilize. Um, so like I said, if you don't want to pay the, uh, I don't remember how much it is, but if you don't want to pay the full amount, just rent it and put it on your Kindle. Um, and you can have it right here in front of you. It's, it's kind of, it'll drive you nuts just a little bit working on this deal here, but uh, it kind of gets you a pretty good idea. But 288 pages, um, really, really good book, highly recommend. Uh, and there's some other, there's a lot of other things out there too, but uh, some other sources of information that I have, um, there's the, uh, there's the book. So, uh, you can buy it new. So yeah, nobody's really going to want to pay a hundred dollars. Don't buy it new. You can buy it used or you could just rent it for, uh, the e-textbook, um, cost me 20 bucks. So, um, you know, that was worth it for me. Uh, so here's another source that I found. So here's, uh, here's some more, some basic calculations of agriculture, irrigation, animal production. Um, and all these links are going to be available on, uh, on the PowerPoint. And I'll upload that here as soon as I get done. Um, but some other really good stuff, uh, kind of get you some ideas. And this is, is more elementary in some of this, but it, it's going to be easier to take it and align it to certain standards in the algebra geometry, things like that. Um, but some pretty good stuff there that you can utilize and, uh, and kind of go with. Uh, here's another good one. Uh, I know it looks like I just pirated this offline, but you can actually download this for free. So um, I think, yeah, so there it is. Uh, but this is, uh, if you do a lot of horticulture stuff, uh, so this is a, a student manual for math and horticulture. Again, some of y'all may have this. I, I found it doing on here. Um, so, you know, you get to looking at some of your Hort stuff. There's a, uh, there's a lot of really tough math in there uh, that I think that you can utilize. Um, you got some pretty elementary stuff there. And then when you get down here, it, uh, it gets a little bit more rigorous. But uh, that's a lot of good stuff that you can pull from, too. Um, you know, and you can utilize this in a lot of different courses as well. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just limited just to your horticulture um, and things like that. So uh next one all right this was something else that i found this is one thing that i really liked uh so this is a a curriculum map in agriculture uh and so basically this takes different courses that you have and it gives you some math concepts that align with the ct concepts so obviously this is not tennessee this is uh this is minnesota here i believe uh, but you know, it, it still gives you some really good ideas of things that you can do. So, you know, if I go down here, uh, that's all mechanic stuff, but let's say I go down here to agri-science. Um, so again, animal science, <coughs> excuse me. So rates proportion percents, uh, measurement proportion, graphing and charts, comparing data, things like that. Um, so that was something that, uh, that I pulled from quite a bit too, because it, it was able to kind of give me those ideas. Um, you know, whenever I started running out of things to really do. So that's a couple of the links that I wanted to show you there. Uh, let me get back up here to the PowerPoint. Um, so that's where these links are right here. Uh, your FFA, uh, National FFA is a good source too. Uh, so you've got these first two right here. It's going to give you some, uh, some good math practicums. Um, one thing that I pull from a whole lot is uh, from Nash, past national practicums. Uh, so floriculture, forestry, farm business management, nursery, food science, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Um, these things are absolutely full of, of math. Um, and they're real simple to get to. Just, just go to FFA.org, go to um, Explore FFA, go to CDELDE. And then once you click on the individual contest, you can go to, Pat, to resources and then uh, it's got a tab there for past national, uh, stuff. So, um, I pull from that all the time. So that's, that's some good stuff there. If you really want to align it to, uh, to certain things. So, um, vet science is going to be another really good one. Uh, you know, I'll go on there whenever Laura's coaching her teams, we'll see some of the math that they're doing. And, you know, it's, that's pretty, 
pretty cool stuff. So, um, so how to implement uh, this? Again, this isn't earth shattering stuff. This is just some kind of common sense approach type things. Uh, bell ringers. Um, I absolutely hate bell ringers uh, because I think whenever I first started using them, um, you know, I did it to uh, basically just kind of appease, you know, a little checkoff. Um, but I think if you have something that you can really implement in your class uh, that coincides with your lesson, then go for it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't use bell ringers that much, but you know, if I'm doing something over soil science that day and agri-science and I have some kind of math concept that I can look at, you know, I can kind of set the stage of that bell ringer and say, okay, here's the basic math principles we need to know in order to do this math over here. Um, so, you know, if we go virtual, and some of y'all will be to start the year, you've got a couple of different options here. Um, Socrative, so creative, I'm not sure how to say it there, but uh, that's a website that I've used now for a few years to, uh, to administer tests for my CDE and LDE teams. Um, absolutely great site, kids can log on there. Uh, they log on with the room name, it takes them straight to the test. Uh, it'll grade it automatically. It'll kick a score right back to them. They do it all on the phone, computer, tablet, whatever. Um, I love that because I absolutely hate spending time during practice taking tests. Um, you know, you can create a math problem of the day. Uh, you create a notebook with all your math problems. Um, have students maintain their own math notebook. Uh, but there again, if you go back, I think if you really try to force this stuff, you know, kids are going to kind of kick back a little bit. And so we'll talk about that in just a minute. So be careful on how you do that. Uh, you know, games are really good. And I'm not saying, you know, sit down and, and clap hands for an hour, that kind of, you know, whatever kind of weird activity just to say that you did something different. But, you know, make games that have some validity of what you're doing. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing a nice business, um, you know, there's all kinds of little games and things like that. You know, you can create your own and things like that. Um, I wouldn't create my own because – I just, I'm not very creative. So, you know, I'm going to try to find stuff that's already made. Um, so show an example, have students create their own problems utilizing the math concept. Uh, remember, we don't need to spoon feed every bit of this to our students. Uh, you know, they've got to be able to think on their own a little bit. And, you know, I've been guilty of this too. Uh, you get so tired of kind of going through there, so you just kind of spoon feed it to them. So, um, you know, make the kids think. Uh, that makes your job a heck of a lot easier some days. Um, if they can really, if they don't get to the point where they rely on you every single time they have a question, you know, let them work with other students, let them work, um, you know, try to figure it out on their own. You know, throw them out in the deep end a little bit. Um, you know, take the floaties off and, and let them kind of go through there and, and figure stuff out on their own. Um, it's okay if they mess up, you know, they got to, I think we got to let these kids grow up a little bit and, and not rely on us for every single little thing. Uh, so this is something that I found. Um, so this is a, a seven step process to implement math uh, and an enhanced lesson. The top part is covered up there. So seven elements, components of math enhanced lesson. So introduce the CT lesson, assess students math awareness as it relates to CT, work through the math example, uh, work through a contextual math example, uh, work through a traditional math example, and then students demonstrate their understand, understanding and formal assessment. So one thing that I like about this is that um, you work through a math and CT example, but you also work through a traditional math example. Um, so I want to tell you, you know, if you look at linear equations and things like that, you know, I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. You know, if it's simple, I can do it, but if it gets really complex, then I'm just, you know, I'm running out of the room. So. Um, this is where it's going to come in hand to where you work with your, your math teachers. Um, but this is the biggest thing right here. Students have to demonstrate their understanding. If we give them that math concept and they don't show us that they really understand it, we've not accomplished anything other than filling time in that class. Um, and I know sometimes it's easier just to move on, but you know, kids are really good at tricking us and making us think that they know what you're doing and know what you're talking about, but they can't tell you about it again after you get done. So, um, you know, figure out a way to, for them to show you that understanding. And that's why, you know, I like going back to this, show an example, have students create their own problems, utilizing the math concept. Uh, so this is an example here. Obviously this is not ag, but if you do, this is, well, it, you can be ag mechanics. Um, but 
this kind of gives you an idea. So uh, we'll move on. But uh, there's been a lot of studies on this. Um, I want to say that uh, I'd run across something that Dr. Stripling uh, and I forget the other individual they were looking at. But, you know, those people that had the PhD next to their name, they can tell you a lot of the, uh, the good stuff better than I can with this. But um, this just seems like a common sense approach to me. Um, it's not something you really got to go through and change your entire teaching style. It's really easy to implement. Um, you know, you just kind of got to work through it. So general tips, uh, we'll hit some of the highlights. We talked about being in a bubble, get out of it, uh, make it practical. Um, the big thing I think is, is make it part of your classroom from week one. If you automatically, and you get through the first nine weeks, the first six weeks, whatever your schedule's on, and, uh, you start just throwing in math concepts every day, those kids are going to revolt on you. Um, I would, you know, I didn't, uh, my whole argument would be that I didn't take a math class, I took an ag class. Um, you know, you're always gonna have those kids that push back on you a little bit because you are implementing some of these other things, but I think that's where we gotta get creative a little bit and go through and say, okay, how can I kind of sneak this in here a little bit? Um, you know, and kind of make it work like that. Uh, talk with your students, find out what they're doing in the math class, align your current lesson with math lessons. Um, yeah, it's like when we're looking at science and biology, you know, if they're talking about uh, cell organelles and functions, why am I going to talk about it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks later? You know, if those kids go to biology and then come to my math or come to my ag class, you know, if they're saying the same thing, it's going to click in their minds a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Um, team teach. Uh, yeah, that's a dirty word for us sometimes. We don't, you know, we don't really... We, well, that's our domain is our classroom. You know, we, uh, we don't really want folks in there sometimes, but um, I think there's a lot of validity to that. And uh, not only is there validity to it, you're creating friends with, uh, with your other co-teachers and, and not friends that you're, you know, going to go out and eat with necessarily, but friends that when you pull your kids out four times in a week, um, they're not going to give you as much kickback. So um, it's a good PR thing. It's a good way to, uh, to kind of get their teaching style and see how you can implement that. Because like I told you, if I go in and I, I look at some of these math concepts, you know, I, you might as well just throw me out of the room because I'm not gonna be able to do them. Um, so here's the big thing with me is that, you know, everything that's going on right now in the United States and across the world, um, you know, it's a little bit concerning to me. You, you know, we're a class and a program that at any point just about could be cut due to funding issues. Um, you know, if they have to choose between adding another math class or taking away an ag class, what do you think they're going to choose? And I think that's something we really have to be honest with ourselves. Um, and we have to justify your class as a contribution to the school, um, not just in math, not just in science, but across the board. Um, you know, we, we got to get out of that bubble. Okay, we've got to validate. Um, you know, one thing that I, I would really like to do is, is after you, uh, you look at a course, uh, keep up with your math, math scores um, after the kids have taken your class with that increased math um, and see how they do compared to non-ag students. You know, there's a lot of studies out there, but there's not studies probably of your own school. So, you know, that would be something kind of cool to look at. So, uh, Big thing out here, what ideas do you have? And so obviously I know you can't talk, but if you go to the poll, um, there's a place there I've put up a question. Uh, I would really like to hear what some of you all do. Um, and uh, because obviously I'm not an expert in this, I just, the whole purpose of this was just to show you kind of what I had made and to share that with you. Um, you know, I know this, this session wasn't really me just sitting down and saying, okay, here's how you fully implement this and here's the, the can't fail way to do this. That's not the case. And I, if that's what you expected, I apologize, but I really wanted to show you what I kind of created and what I'm going to utilize. Um, so I would really appreciate if you can go through there and, uh, and answer that question and, and tell us what you do, because I know some of y'all are a heck of a lot better teacher than I am. Uh, so let's take advantage of it. Okay. Let's, let's kind of go from there. So, um, that is all that I have on that. Uh, let me stop sharing my, well, I guess I'll leave it up for just a second. Um, were there any questions that come up in the chat? 
Yeah, Ryan, you had two questions. Let me go back to that window. First question was, what was the name of that book, again, that you showed uh, a few minutes ago? Uh, that was Mathematical Applications in Agriculture. Um, it's a Cengage book. If you just search Math Applications in Ag on Google, it'll take you straight to it. Okay, second question was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are there any vet science formulations? Yes, uh, I have a few in this document, but there's a whole book. Uh, I know that I stole some out of Laura's book um, in her, her classroom, but uh, yeah, there's a whole book on that um, that you can steal. And if you just search uh, veterinary medicine dosage or, or things like that, then that's going to bring up a lot of information there uh, that you can really kind of do. So um, I think that's probably one of the easiest courses to really, really implement the math in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that'd be great. So, anything else? All right. No, there are no more questions. Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all very much. And if, uh, if you have any questions, reach out to me. I don't mind to, I mean, this wasn't earth shattering stuff, but I don't mind to, to let you know what I've got. But thank y'all for coming in. And uh, I'll put that PowerPoint up here in just a second with those links. Okay, Thank folks, the, uh, the key word for this session is charming with capital C. That's as in Prince Charming, charming. And uh, thank you all for being here. And just a reminder, the session is being recorded and it will be available on the recorded sessions tab on, in this site by the end of today. And uh, as Ryan mentioned, don't forget to take the survey. The link is at the bottom of this page. And Ryan, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Y'all have a great day.